Okay, so uh, this week we're in Titus chapter 2, uh, but just to kind of give you a little bit of background information, because I know everybody has forgot what we talked about uh, two weeks ago now. So uh, Titus 1, you know, was bringing us into um, really just furthering the study that we've been doing through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, saying a lot of the same stuff. Uh, although maybe touching in different areas and getting a little deeper. Very good, uh, uh, Titus, just three little old chapters, but packed full of information. Um, it's really been a blessing to me to get to study this because I've never really studied it at depth the way I have. And it's like, man, it's hard to give just a summary off of these because the verses, for the most part, there's... 29 sermons in each verse, you know, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to well, break it all down. My jacket must be rubbing the mic, so excuse the brushing noise when you hear it. All right, so uh, anyway, for uh, um, just to kind of bring us back up to speed, remember that uh, Titus had the uh, ministry and he went alongside of Paul for several years. Uh, Titus is well aware of the doctrine and teachings of the Apostle Paul. In chapters 1, uh, verse 4, Paul called Titus a true son of the common faith. And of course we know that meant a son of the faith, not his son. Uh, probably Paul may have been the one who led him to the Lord. Don't know. He may have got saved under Paul's ministry somehow, but that's probably the most accurate way to look at it. In verse 5, Paul says that, uh, talking to uh, Titus, says, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remains in order and appoint elders in every town as I direct you. Also in verses 5 and 9, Paul used the term elder and overseer. Overseer, another word for pastor. Uh, interchangeably and list all the qualifications they must have for those offices. And in verses 10 through 16, Paul instructs Titus on how to handle the false teachers that were disrupting the churches in Crete. The Apostle Paul gave Titus instructions in verse 13 to rebuke them, the false teachers, sharply that they may be sound in their faith. So in summary of the chapter 1 in verses 15 and 16, Paul went on to say about the false teachers that they are defiled and unbelieving. Nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now that's a rebuke, isn't it? So whether Titus told them or not, Paul, the apostle, told him that in a letter that he sent to Titus, which would be distributed amongst the churches, and I'm sure a copy would get into the hands of these false teachers. Uh, but it was also Titus's job to rebuke them, to stand firm for the gospel, to stand true to the gospel, to the doctrines that he had been taught through the apostle Paul. Uh, we also saw that from uh, our first week that when Titus was ministering with Paul, he was also active in the church at Corinth. Not to go back into all of that, but just to show you that Titus had a lot of ministry with the Apostle Paul. Uh, so in chapter 1, we see that it deals with the leadership of the church. And obviously the church has to be set in order with regard to its leaders. Careful detail is given as to the kind of men and the duties of those men who are to be pastors and elders. So as we pick up in chapter 2 of Titus, uh, we're going to take a little uh, stroll here through these passages. And I've got a limited amount of time to get all this done in, so I've tried to condense it and bring out some of the main points. Uh, so just bear with me as we kind of rush through uh, some of this. Uh, but first, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just pray for your wisdom. We pray for your leadership. We pray for your guidance. God, open up your word to us. Uh, help me to be able to expound upon it. Open our ears up, our hearts, Lord, that we may receive it. And the Lord, that we may put it to practice. Uh, that, God, we can give you glory. And, of course, that glorifies you. 
And we just ask for your blessings upon this service, your blessings upon the uh, worship service. Um, uh, be with Daniel as he's teaching his class right now, and also uh, as he brings the sermon uh, this morning. We ask that your spirit to be involved, which I know that uh, he is, in working on our hearts, conditioning us to be better Christians, those that don't know Christ. Uh, may the Holy Spirit draw them into a relationship with Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So in verse 1 of chapter 2 it says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. So we can ask, does doctrine matter? We've seen this theme so many times. And the answer would have to be yes and yes. <laughs> in uh, First and Second Timothy now and in Titus is the theme of teaching sound doctrine and the call for sound living. Healthy doctrine will produce healthy living. The word sound here in the Greek basically gives us the word hygiene, which is, means healthy. So the Lord is concerned about healthy doctrine and healthy living, and they are linked. You can't separate one from the other. Remember that in chapter 1 how the false teachers were teaching unsound doctrine, which produces unsound living, or unhealthy doctrine, which produces unhealthy Christians. Hmm. So the character of a healthy church is what we'll be looking at this week. So chapter 2 is it teaches the church on how to live. Verse 2 we just kind of break this down and go into some of it. I ain't going to go into all the details. Time doesn't allow to. Um, so just surpass a, a summary of some of these verses to, to be adequate for at this time. But I would encourage you at your own leisure and in your own time, look up these verses. Look up the words and look into Greek meaning of these words. Which most of the time our English words are pretty compatible, but sometimes the Greek gives it much more depth. So if you have a Greek lexicon or some kind of a concordance or something that may give you some, um, a little bit of a definition of these Greek words, then by all means I, I suggest that you use that. But in verse 2 it says, older men are to be sober minded, um, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. These commands are to teach the things means that they do not come automatically with age. So why else would he give these, these commands, these directions, if it just automatically happens with age? Because here it's talking about older men. I don't think it's talking about elders as in the word that we've been looking at for elders, which could be a young man as well. But these are really what it means. It implies older men, which should be wisdom, should be some knowledge, should be some learning, should be skills and, and all of the things uh, that come with, with age. Um, but with age, what happens? We sometimes we tend to be a little hardened, hard to change us, hard to change our thinking, hard to change our ways, hard to change our behaviors. But that's the spirit of God's work that's in our hearts that can change anybody and anyone in any way and for whatever cause. And of course here the cause is for the glory of God. So we know that the Holy Spirit is going to be at work in our lives to change us, to equip us. Not only does it challenge us to behave a certain way, the spirit of God equips us to live up to that. If so, it'd be like dangling the carrot before the horse, you know, a, a, a goal or, or something I'm reaching for that I can never achieve. So the fact that God asked us to live a certain way means that he is going to give us the ability, the wherewithal that we need to fulfill that, to live that way. And of course, we can't take the credit because it's the Holy Spirit that works in us. We just yield. We just allow the Spirit to have control of our lives. Uh, I like to use a, a phrase sometimes, you know, when you're, so you're just standing around talking and you have a tendency to want to exaggerate or, 
you know, that sounds better than lying, right? <laughs> and you may be tempted to exaggerate. Then uh, the, the spirit's going to come up and he's going to be like a cop. He's going to arrest you. He's going to say, Mm-mm, Steve, don't say that. And I can either allow him to arrest me, to stop me, to handcuff me, to bridle my mouth in this case. Or I can just resist that and deny the God quality that could be produced in me and override that and go ahead and say that fish was this big when it was only this big. It weighed 29 pounds when it wasn't even 2 pounds. <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, you just take it wherever you want to go with it. But that's the way we can be sometimes. And the Spirit of God will check us. Our conscience will condemn us when we, when we kind of want to stumble into that. And hopefully we won't do it. But when we do, what's the end result? It should bring us to repentance. Our guilty conscience should condemn us. This is Christian living. This is what it means. If your conscience doesn't convict you and you can just sin and enjoy it and don't feel condemned when you do it, there's probably a pretty good reason. You may need to know the Lord and you might need the Holy Spirit in your life. So if the Holy Spirit is in your life, you will feel conviction. Anyway, leads us to repentance, which produces holy living. Um, so I was referring to the men, how we can be hardened. Well, it's okay to be hardened if we're hardened in a way that leads us into ways of faith, love, patience, and then the good things. Uh, which it said there that the older men are to be so, uh, sober-minded, uh, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So if you've got all those things working in your life, then that's a good way to be hardened. Don't soften up a bit. Don't change a thing. Just keep living for the glory of God. Well, it doesn't just stop at old men. It goes on to the women that are older. <laughs> I don't want to call them old women because somebody might think if I look at them, I'm referring to them. So I'm trying to look at the men right now. So <laughs> uh, but in verse 3, it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous or uh, slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their husbands, that the word of God may be, uh, may not be reviled. I know I'm walking in some dangerous territory right here because women of the day don't want to hear this submission stuff. But it's scripture. It's the Bible. We can't get around it. But what does it mean? It doesn't mean that you got to uh, submit to a ogre who is just being just the, the evilest thing that ever was and trying to lead you into sin and all that kind of stuff. When it comes to that, then you submit to God and you have to defy those orders and the re repercussions that may come along with it. Doesn't give us a, a reason uh, to sin or to strike back or what have you. But anyway, it's, there's some things here that go beyond just being submissive. If, if you're submitted to your husband, and submissive to loving them, sometimes that can turn an old hard heart a little bit soft when he sees the love and respect that a wife can give him. I don't want to harp too much on the women when I didn't do much on the men. But we ain't done with the men completely here, so it'll still work back in somewhat here with the younger men. But the responsibility for women, I know because women in this day and time with all the women live and stuff and the way it is, get beat up so bad, especially you ladies who are trying to be obedient to the scriptures. Uh, you, you look down on and you're just you know, ridiculed by the world because 
you need to be independent. You need to make your own way. You need to do all these things that could go against Scripture. And there's nothing wrong with women being independent. Uh, what are you going to do with a single woman, widow woman? They got to be independent. They don't have a husband, you know. So there, there's always uh, variables in here to where everything's not being addressed. And I don't have time to get into all of that. But just bear this to be said. Women, they have their own set of temptations and opportunities. So let that be said. But David um, Gwizak, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, in his commentary has said uh, about these passages, God has given women a strategic yeah, strategic, I can't say it right now. You know what I'm saying. A position of influence and the assistance to their husbands and their children. And they must let love dominate their influence and assistance. You women have a lot of power. You have a lot of influence. You can influence that man for good behavior. You can influence the next generation. The children. Men, probably for the most part, are a bad influence. But you women, nurture them. The children come to you for nurture and for guidance and for wisdom a lot of times. Of course, they should come to the dad as well. But women have, the in biblical times, their roles were in the home. They did a lot of things. It didn't just mean doing housework. They did things outside the house and all. But their main thing, the main thrust of their uh, their lives was in raising the children, raising the next generation. So you can really impact the world for Christ in the way that you instill godly character in your children. So verse 6 goes on and says, Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Uh, Gwizak also says, uh, Likewise, this is linked to the word. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Throwing it in with the men and the women. It shows that while the young men need to uh, learn isn't all that's different from what the younger women and the older women and the older men need to learn. We may need to slightly different uh, emphasis depending on our situations in life for the essential message of godly living is the same. They got the same, young people have the same message as we older people do or the younger women do. It is the same thing. We all need to live godly in this world. Now, to you, Titus, it says in verse 7, show yourself in all respect to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity uh, uh, and dignity. And sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opportunity may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So Titus had to be more than a teacher. He also had to be an example. Hmm. So just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you don't have to live up to it. You're not a good teacher if you're not living up to what you're teaching. But when it comes to scripture, nobody's perfect. Every teacher falls short because we're not perfect. We're human. There is no way that I can live up to the mandates that Holy Scripture demands out of me as a man, as an elder, as a human. There's no way that you can live up to the demands the Scripture puts on you. Well, say, well, why does God do that then if we can't live up to it? Well, there again, we're right back to where there is this high calling. If God set the bar so low that we would easily achieve it, then there would be no, no reason to try to excel, no reason to try to do better, to achieve more, to find God at a higher plane. So the more we learn of God, the more we deny ourselves and the more we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the more we will see the life of God manifested in us. And there's no way we'll ever reach total sanctification on this side of heaven. But we're to strive for that. We're to run that race 
that is set before us. You know, there's a prize that's out there. The runner doesn't just run to be running. He runs for the prize. What is the prize for the runner in regard to a Christian? Jesus Christ. To be like him. To see him face to face, which we'll also look at here toward the end of these. Um, that is the goal. We run this race to be Christ-like, and of course, in the end, to be uh, in the presence of Christ. So verse 9 moves on now to bondservants. Uh, in verse 9 it says, bondservants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleased, not argumentative, but uh, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Simply Titus must direct slay, uh, servants to be good workers in uh, all ways. By their hard work and humble submission, they will adorn the doctrine of the God of our, our Savior. How do the slaves give honor and glory to God? of being obedient to their masters. So if we have been bought with the price, Christ has redeemed us. Remember, I think I talked about this in chapter 1, that we are slaves to God. We are slaves of Christ. Then if we are going to be obedient to our master, we need to obey him in everything. So this is talking about producing godly living. Verse or chapter 2, this is what all this is about. Chapter 1 was setting up the authority in the church that could help teach and lead and guide the people into Christian living. Christian living now is being lived out. That's what we're seeing here. All these things that we can put together in this and that we can incorporate into our life produce better quality of Christians. So a slave may come to church back in these days and does it mean that uh, Paul or that God was totally in, a, in, in approval of slaves? It's something that went on. The scriptures do it, don't deny that. They do talk about it. But I'm sure Paul would, as he mentioned before, if you can get your freedom, then get your freedom. But this is the way society is set up. This way it is. Then you are to obey them. But in the Christian church... A slave could be a member in the congregation. You know, and it's, it, it's even possible that he could have possibly been an elder, elder uh, of the master who may have just been a member. It's possible. So now he has to kind of like, the master would have to take some guidance, some authority, and somewhat from his slave. All because if he is going to honor God, he has to honor God and he has to honor God's authority. God's authority is passed down through the eldership of the church. The pastor and the elders uh, set the authority, the spiritual tone of the church. So uh, uh, the, to be a slave could just mean simply something for us today. We all work for someone. While you're on the job, are you not to obey that master? <laughs> you may not have a job very long if you don't, right? So some are self-employed. Hey, that's good. You're your own master and your own slave. So <laughs> you still got to work. You still got to, you got your job. You got to get it done. But that means that we are to submit to that. We are to respect them. By respecting them, we respect God. We give honor to God. And by doing that, we could be leading people into salvation. As they see our good qualities, our good character coming forth from us, the world should be looking in and seeing that we're different. If they look in our church and they see us no different than them, what is desirable about that? How can that God change when I see these people that darken that door every Sunday and Wednesday and whatever days the doors are open? And they live just as bad, if not worse, lives than I do. That God can't change nobody. That God is powerless. That God has nothing to offer. But if they look at us and they see changed lives, they see godly character, they see the love of Christ, they see compassion, they see all the things that should be uh, uh, part of our character, then there's something to that God that they serve. 
I need to know that God. That's the purpose that we are to live out this godly mandate so that the world can see us and want our God. To the effect that we live our lives before the Lord Jesus Christ is the effect that we have on the community around us, our family around us, our co-workers, the person in the grocery store, you know, whoever, wherever we meet anyone, or we live in a way that when they look at us, they'll say, I believe that person's a Christian. I can just tell by the way they carry herself. I can tell by the way they act. I can tell by the way they talk. You know, they didn't, didn't always give in to <clears throat> everything that, uh, that was going on around them. Okay, so in verse 11, we see here that for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. What happens? Grace brings salvation. All men find salvation by grace of God. Not some men. Not those who work hard find grace. Not those who achieve. Not those who have excelled. Not those who have done everything. Who may have crawled up the mountain on their knees and kissed the feet of whatever Buddha God or whatever it was that they were serving. They're not the ones that get saved. It is only through the grace of God and that all men find salvation by grace. You can't earn it. No one can work for their salvation. No one will get in to God's holy heaven unless they have accepted Christ as their Savior. So you don't uh, go out and get salvation it comes to you you have the opportunity to receive it what grace teaches us in verse 12 says it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled upright and godly lives in the present age thus you can see the grace has its own uh, disciplines you are a disciple of the grace of God did you ever come to submit yourself to it? Spurgeon said. Hmm. So if you can't find yourself submitting to this grace of God and the disciplines that come along with it. When it says don't do this, don't do that. Behave like this, behave like that. If you can't follow those disciplines, then it may be that you haven't come to know uh, that Christ. So in verse 13, it says, wait for our blessed hope, uh, or waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That hope is not heaven or just the glory of that, but Jesus himself, which we will see face to face one day. So what is that blessed hope? That blessed hope is Christ. He is known as our blessed hope. It's all great and good and fine and we all want to go to heaven. But what would heaven be without Christ? It's all about Christ. We serve a living Christ. And to the degree that we want to be more like him, if he is the pattern and even Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul found it safe to say that if you followed him, you would be in the right direction heading toward Christ. So as we seek that blessed hope, we seek that blessed hope in the sense of it being revealed, of it coming to us. I say it, it's he, of Christ coming to us. That one day will happen, whether we die the normal way that a lot of people go into the presence of the Lord, or when he comes back and reveals himself to the church in person. Are you yearning for that day? I'm not yearning to die. I got a lot to live for. But I do yearn to see Christ. Whether that means dying, leaving this world, or his sudden return and you, you, you meet him that way. 
That's the, either way is going to be great. There's no way to downplay one or the other. But I, it just seems like it would be more glorious to see him, bam, you know, just uh, appear, you know, as he comes from heaven. And we then are caught up into his presence. Uh, that sounds pretty exciting to me. Uh, I would love to go that way. But there's been people for thousands of years who have wanted to go that way. And it hasn't happened for them. So why do I think it would happen for me? Could? We don't know. Right? So, um, remember, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice how they use the great God and Jesus Christ together. The appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is God. He is our Savior. Great God generally applies to God when we're thinking about God, Jehovah, Yahweh, uh, uh, you know, Yushio, whenever we think about Jesus, uh, you know, as being two separate entities. But remember, they're one. <laughs> they're one and the same. That's the perplexing thing about it. You got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct, but one. You know, that's, I ain't saying you got to understand it because I don't fully understand it. Uh, but it is a reality. That is uh, the way it goes. Uh, so notice also that it said that we are to be self-controlled in this present age. It doesn't matter what, what time we find ourselves, what age we're in, wherever we are in life. There's no excuse. Things are so bad. We're, the world is so corrupt. You know, I might as well just be like the world. Everybody's living this way, so I might as well live that way too. That's no attitude. In this present world means you've got to live the way Scripture demands us to live, no matter what the conditions are. And maybe we could pray, though, oh, may God just send revival and just close down all the jip joints and all the, the, the raunchy places and everything. And then there won't be all this sin that's tempting us and all of the, the TV programs would go perfect. There wouldn't be no more uh, all of these things to lust at on TV and the things that would draw me into to, uh, maybe a life of alcohol or, or whatever your addiction may uh, be. You know, the TV would just clean up and everything would be great. I could serve God that way. No, that's not, it's not painting a picture of you can serve God better when everything's perfect. Doesn't also paint the picture that you can serve God better when everything's horrible either. But it doesn't matter. Whatever conditions we are in life, we serve God with a whole heart. Fullness. It, there's no restraints. Whatever this present age is, serve God. Serve God. So, as we've seen that Jesus is the goal, it's not heaven. That's the reward. That's great. We all want to go to heaven. But Jesus is what we're really looking for. Now we see the heart of, the, of, of God and his grace. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So that's talking about redemption. So what does redemption mean? To be brought out of slavery by the paying of a ransom. We are bought out of slavery, slavery to sin and purchased for his service. Remember how Romans talked about that we were slaves to sin? No matter how hard we fought before Christ, outside of Christ, no matter how hard we resisted, we found ourselves continually sinning. It was our nature. 
We just sin because we're sinners. Oh, it didn't mean we couldn't do some righteous acts. We could do some good deeds and all those things. I mean, everybody's not as, uh, every sinner, they're not as evil as they could be. You know, we're not all Hitlers or whoever you could think of as uh, Jeffrey Dahmers or whatever, you know. We're not all those type of people. There are some good moral people in the world. But they're still lost. They still need redeemed, be, to be redeemed. They still need a Savior. And if Christ then becomes the ransom, he paid the ransom to get us out of that sin, to bring us into his kingdom, then he has brought us out of slavery to sin and has purchased us for his service. He now becomes your Lord or your master. And if he's your Lord and your master, you want to please him. And all that we do, we say, we think, and we know that's a struggle. He knows that's a struggle. He lived in this body, but yet the temptations of sin were there, but he didn't sin. We say, well, he was God. Yes, he was. That's how he can be so easily touched by our infirmities. He knows the struggles that we go through. He has grace to cover that. He has the means to, to give us what it takes to bring us into his presence. He paid the penalty of sin and he purchased us for his service. Verse 15 declares that these things exhort rebuke with all authority. Let no one disrespect you. So again, Paul is letting Titus know, as he did in chapter 1, you have authority. You have authority to take this word, to take this message into the church and teach it, demand it, rebuke with it, exhort with it, whatever the need that arises, whatever method needs to be there, you have all authority to do that, Titus. You set up other men, elders in your church, to do the same. And that goes for every church that was in Crete. That also goes for every church that's in Manning. It goes for every church in South Carolina. And it goes for every church in the world. That's the God's method of way of setting up the leadership in the church. We don't submit to man. We submit to God. You may not respect the elders or the pastor. But when you submit to their authority, when it's biblical, when they're coming from scripture, it's doctrinal, it's sound. There's no question about it. You're not submitting to their leadership. Eh, in essence, you are. But ultimately, you're submitting to God. It's God that we serve. You don't serve me. You don't serve Daniel. You don't serve Mike. You don't serve Brad. You don't serve us. You serve God. Or Mickey, he's not here. You don't, you, don't, you don't serve us. But God has placed the leadership in a position to lead, to guide, to instruct, to challenge you, to rebuke you at times, but to love you, even in that rebuke, to go on with Christ, to set your face as flint, to Make your goal to be like Christ. And that should be our goal. So pray for us as we try to be obedient to scriptures. You be obedient to scriptures. We, ha we have a mandate. We have to be obedient to scriptures. No one is, uh, is exempt from this. We all have to be obedient. So, but scripture also gives us a warning. Don't let all... Everyone shouldn't desire to be a teacher. Why? Because there's a greater condemnation comes to those who teach. If we teach, and then we go live contrary to what we teach, there's a greater condemnation coming on us. But elders are required to be teachers. One of their qualifications 
is they must be able to teach. Hmm. Go back and read those in that. But God's messengers are to remember that they are messengers from a king. Holding the word that brings life and turns back hell. We are snatching brands from the fire, so to speak. As we take the word of God into the world, as we proclaim the word of God, we don't know the effect it's going to have on someone. Hopefully someone hears it and they repent. They come to Christ. They just missed hell. What, how, how much better can that be? And we don't know who the elect are. It doesn't matter. We to preach as if we know everybody's elect. It doesn't matter. God will do the choosing. We don't do the choosing. He does the saving. We don't do the saving. He does the cleaning. We don't do the cleaning. We just do the preaching. We do the teaching. We do the exhorting. And then God cleans them up. God does the sanctification. And the sanctification will only take place uh, as the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, teaching. Um, hope that uh, this didn't fall on deaf ears. Uh, Father, I wish I could have done a better job. But, uh, Lord, it is what it is. You use us no matter who we are, our abilities, what have you. Uh, but, God, you can still use that for your glory. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.